Hello, everyone. Welcome. This is a snowy day for our fourth lecture. What a great time to stay inside and enjoy a terrific speaker. One thing I wanted to mention also is this weekend, you should be receiving an email from Glenn Roa, which will contain your re a request for you to fill out a feedback form on the first four lectures. Please take a few moments to do that. We really value your input. So when you see this, you'll push reply, then you fill out the questions, just answer each question, then push send, Glenn will get it back, and then we can see what you're saying. We really appreciate your help. So now I'd like to ask Michael Orlansky of our program committee to please introduce today's speaker. Michael. Thank you so much, Carol, and hello, everyone. Today, it's my special pleasure and honor to introduce Ajay Brigis, Assistant Professor of Political Science at Middlebury College. Professor Brigis did his undergraduate work at Temple University, studying political science and French, and earned his PhD in political science at the George Washington University. He held a postdoctoral fellowship at Stanford's Asia Pacific Research Center and he taught at the University of South Florida and the University of California, Riverside, prior to joining Middlebury's Distinguished Political Science Department in 2020. Professor Verghese has teaching and research interests that include Indian politics, ethnicity, political violence, historical legacies, and the interactions between religion and politics. His first book, was The Colonial Origins of Ethnic Violence in India, published by Stanford University Press. He has also contributed to leading academic journals on Asian studies, political violence, development, and politics and religion. Professor Verghese has a book in progress about secularization in Hinduism, a project which is supported by the Fulbright Program and the American Institute of Indian Studies. Also, in his free time, Professor Brigis is an avid tennis fan. Last year, in fact, at a tennis tournament in Washington, D.C., he met his favorite tennis player, Rafael Nadal of Spain. The title of today's lecture is Hinduism and Political Behavior. Please join me in giving a warm Triple E welcome to Professor Ajay Brigis. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Michael and Carol, for uh, for that introduction. Um, it is true I met uh, Nadal over the summer, and then he just won the Australian Open. I, I like to take some credit for that, of course. Um, so I'm I'm so thrilled to have the opportunity to uh, speak with all of you today about uh, a project <coughs> that I've been working on for. A few years and obviously COVID has uh, kind of disrupted my research plans a little bit, but I can talk to you about it at a time when uh, I can still get a lot of feedback about uh, about my about my work. Um, so um, the the title of my talk will be um, Hinduism and uh, political behavior, um, and um, I, I want to just start off with um, an image that appeared in a lot of Indian newspapers. Um, about uh, uh, two, two years ago. Um, who is this uh, uh, robed man? You might assume he is a, a Hindu monk or a mendicant or some kind of great uh, spiritual teacher uh, in, a, in a cave um, meditating. It is actually the Indian prime minister. I'm sure a lot of you might recognize him, uh, Narendra Modi, uh, who has uh, been the prime minister since 20. 14, and he is the leader of uh, the Bharatiya Janata Party, which translates to the Indian People's Party. Uh, it's actually the world's largest political party by membership. And uh, Narendra Modi leads this party, which uh, in, in Western discourse is usually called a Hindu nationalist party, a, a party that is quite militant about uh, Hinduism and kind of promoting uh, Hinduism and Indian civilization as, uh, as, as similar things, as basically the same thing. Um, uh, Narendra Modi is not very uh, camera shy. He likes being in front of the cameras. And this is the image that he is projecting to people in India and people around the world, that he is a very devout uh, Hindu. So what's interesting is if you actually read 
some of the academic literature about uh, Hinduism and politics, uh, one of the first questions you might ask yourself is, uh, does this kind of outreach by Narendra Modi, does it actually work? Um, does he get Hindus to vote for him and do mo more pious Hindus, uh, are they more likely to vote for him and to like uh, Narendra Modi? Um, so there are a few scholars who have uh, asked this question. And in order to ask that question, you really have to be able to measure uh, what it means to be pious within the Hindu tradition. And so existing scholarship basically has relied on one or two survey questions done by uh, an organization called the Indian National Election Study. We have the American National Election Study. It's a voter survey. And so here's uh, the question uh, from the questionnaire. Now I will ask you a few, uh, ask you about a few religious activities. You tell me how often you do these, <coughs> daily, weekly, only during festivals or never. Uh, so prayer, right, which is uh, translated here as puja. Um, that's the term in Hindi, which actually means worship, worship of the deity and uh, visiting temple. Uh, so you can imagine that if we're asking, we're trying to figure out if someone is a very pious Christian, for example, we might ask similar questions. Do you pray? Uh, do you go to church? We might ask the same questions of someone who is uh, Muslim, right? Do you uh, do namaz? And then do you go to mosque? Um, and when you use this question, what existing political re science research finds is that uh, the more pious you are, uh, the more religious you are as a Hindu, um, that does not make you more likely to vote for the BJP, which is kind of a surprising finding. So then why is Narendra Modi spending this time in a cold cave uh, meditating in front of cameras? Um, so the two research questions that I'm going to talk about today uh, are first, how, how do we actually measure religiosity in the Hindu tradition? In order to understand how Hinduism affects politics, we first have to understand how we measure Hinduism. Um, second, once we've done that, uh, what is the effect of Hinduism or Hindu piety on political behavior in India? So in order to kind of preview some of my main findings, um, I develop a new survey questionnaire to measure Hindu religiosity. And I find that in line with existing work, um, being a more pious Hindu does not uh, predict voting for the BJP. Um, and it's kind of an interesting finding, and we can talk about then what is all the outreach for. Um, I'll try to I'll try to explain that. But basically, I don't see a relationship between <coughs> excuse me Hindu religiosity and voting for uh, the Hindu Nationalist Party. Uh, however, I do find that the more religious you are, uh, this does predict your views on Indian secularism. Um, I'll define what that is. Secularism in the Indian context means something very different than we are accustomed to here in the United States. Um, but being very pious does uh, tend to predict your attitudes about, uh, about secularism. Um, more specifically, the more pious you are as a Hindu, the less likely you are to support uh, Indian secularism. The less likely you are to say, that the government should be neutral in religious affairs, that it should treat all religious groups equally. Um, so some findings that show there is a very clear relationship between uh, religion and political behavior and some other findings that uh, kind of temper that. Um, so let me just give you a, a brief outline of uh, the talk. Uh, so first I'm going to discuss the process by which I um, went about trying to measure Hindu uh, religiosity. Um, second, I'm going to uh, explain um, a, a survey that I did in North India uh, in the state um, of Bihar. Uh, that was in early uh, 2018. And in 2020, my plan was to uh, do a larger stir a survey in about another seven to nine states, but uh, that work unfortunately is still, is still on hold. Um, but I will talk about the survey that I did in Bihar and, 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 and uh, the third thing will then be talking about some of the research findings from that survey. And then I'll end by talking, uh, just kind of concluding with my findings and talking about some of the comparative implications of this project, because I think what we learn about in India uh, could potentially give us more of an understanding of religious traditions um, in other parts of Asia. Uh, for example, Southeast Asia, you have Buddhism, for example, and uh, and uh, East Asia, you have Shinto in Japan. Um, 
So let me start by talking about uh, Hindu religiosity. So this is this is a uh, image that you will find all over uh, India. Very bright um, uh, image of lots of different uh, deities, and this is just kind of one corner of uh, a Hindu temple. They're incredibly uh, festive, colorful uh, places, um, and it kind of is a is a good image that I often like to show my students because it just shows all the multiplicity of Hinduism, all the multiplicity of views, of deities, of philosophies. It's, uh, it's not an easy religion to understand. So how exactly is Hinduism different from, <coughs> from the um, religions that we're used to here in the United States? And uh, I'm thinking mainly of the Abrahamic religions of uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, what are also known as kind of the three great monotheistic traditions. So how is Hinduism different? Well, compared to the Abrahamic religions, Hinduism has no founder, right? There is no Jesus, there is no Muhammad, there's no Moses. Um, we uh, talk within the Hindu tradition about various sages or, or wise men, but there's no single founder um, of the religion. Um, unlike the Abrahamic religions, uh, Hinduism is polytheistic, but I have to say, I have to include this here, maybe. It's, it's not actually clear how we would uh, actually categorize religion. Um, there are, uh, by, by some estimates, tens of thousands of gods that are worshipped all over India. Um, but at the same time, I think many Hindus would say that all of these gods are just manifestations of one god. Um, and so you could say that it is kind of monotheistic because there is one God, but many different kind of formations. Usually academically, we would say it's, it's polytheistic, but, um, you know, no one has convincingly, uh, has, uh, has convincingly defined it as, as one or the other. Uh, so that just kind of adds to the confusion. Um, unlike the Abrahamic religions, there's no central religious text. Uh, sometimes I have students who say, well, isn't it? The Mahabharata or the Ramayana or, you know, part of the Mahabharata, the Bhagavad Gita, Western audiences uh, know some of these texts. Those are, of course, important texts, um, but they don't uh, have the same kind of equivalent power of something like the Bible or, uh, of the, or, or the Quran. Um, th these are texts that are important, but also um, there are lots of Hindus who are not literate. And uh, for them, they learn about their uh, their religion um, uh, orally. They learn it through the recitation of stories or songs. And so religious texts are, are not as important in this tradition. There's no kind of organization of the Hindu religion. There's no hierarchy of priesthood. There aren't bishops and there aren't, uh, that there's no pope, of course. Um, compared to the Abrahamic religions, it's not conversionary. Uh, I always like to say Hinduism is a very exclusive club. You are born into it or not. Um, there are some people who claim that they have converted to Hinduism, but that's a very controversial thing to say. And I think most Hindus would say you cannot convert to become a Hindu. You can convert from Hinduism to something else, but you cannot convert into Hinduism. Um, one of the really big differences is, is just the lack of compulsory practices or beliefs, including, <coughs> excuse me, including belief in God. Um, it's actually not required of you to believe in God. And many of the um, uh, uh, orthodox uh, philosophical schools of Hinduism were atheistic. They didn't talk about a creator God. They didn't really discuss God at all. Um, so uh, as a Hindu, you don't really have to believe in God. You don't have to go uh, to temple. And you're now seeing why it, it, th that makes it a bit complicated when we ask these survey questions, because we assume that believing in God and going to temple is important, but that's not necessarily true. One of my favorite quotes about Hinduism by the um, religious studies scholar Axel Michaels, he describes it as an impenetrable jungle, uh, an all-absorbent sponge, a net snaring everything. Uh, it's just kind of a nice way of, of putting it. So the word that we use to uh, um, uh, the word that we use to translate uh, religion is uh, the word dharm, or very often uh, in English, we just say dharma. Um, this has been translated as religion, but it's also been translated in all these other ways. Law, duty, norm, social usage, right conduct, righteousness, that which holds the world together. It's a very complicated term. So in order to be a pious Hindu, you could be an atheist and someone who never goes to temple. 
So if we're asking people, do you believe in God and do you go to temple, it might not really tell us anything at all. So how can we actually measure religiosity within this tradition? So what I did in late 2017, before I did my larger survey in early uh, 2018, was I went to some uh, Indian uh, villages um, in North India in, this, in the state of Bihar, and I found uh, two villages that were close to the state capital of Patna, about 30, 45 minutes away. And I traveled there with the survey team. And I wanted to kind of do an experiment. Uh, I went to two villages that were um, very close to one another. They were very, very similar. You can just imagine kind of two towns in Vermont that are, that are close to each other that are pretty similar. And I went into these villages and in um, both villages, I randomly dis distributed two versions of a survey. Uh, one version, <coughs> excuse me, had closed ended questions about religion. So I would just ask people questions like, uh, what kinds of religious activities do you do? And I would provide them with a list where I would say, what kind of religious things do you believe in? And I would provide them with the list. And then the other group of respondents got basically open-ended questions. So I said, what are your religious activities? I didn't give them a list. I just let them say whatever they wanted. And I had my survey enumerators recorded. Um, I would ask them, what are your religious beliefs? And I would just have them record um, whatever came up. So I'll show you <coughs> an example of what this looks like. So in one version of the survey, I asked Hindus, um, what are your rituals? And I looked at these existing surveys that we have uh, that other scholars have used, and I just took uh, responses from those lists. So I asked them, do you perform the following rituals? Do you give religious donations? You can see here on the left, the closed-ended version, 96% of people said, yes, we give religious donations. I don't know if the number is actually that high. I'm guessing some people are probably uh, lying just to kind of sound good. But in any case, um, a, a large number of people at least claim that they are giving donations. 90% uh, of people say uh, we do puja when they are asked. Do you, do you worship the deity, basically? Okay. They say yes. Do you visit a temple? 90% of them say yes. Um, do you um, perform kathas? Kathas are, is a term that means myth. So it's actually like a recitation of uh, the Mahabharata or the Ramayana, a, rec a, a recitation of these Hindu epic stories. Um, do you consult the pundit about auspicious timing? So the pundit is the priest and auspicious timing. So for example, if you're thinking about getting married, if you're a Hindu, you would probably never, ever, ever set a wedding date without going and talking to a priest or an astrologer about the date beforehand. Because if you pick the wrong date, an aus inauspicious date, then you will probably get married or something else bad will happen to you. Maybe you want to try to conceive a child and you won't have any success, right? So you have to go and talk to the pundit and say, what is an auspicious day to get married so that my wedding will, my marriage will be happy and successful. So about 88% of people say, yes, we, we do these things. And one big thing, especially for Hindu women is fasting. Um, <coughs> during religious festivals, especially, women will fast, you know, sometimes for 12 hours or sometimes for multiple days. It, it really kind of depends. Now, the other version of the survey, I asked people, what are your rituals? And I didn't give them any responses. And I wanted to see if they mentioned the things in the close end. Did they mention donations? Did they mention kathas? Did they mention fasting? That kind of stuff. And as you can see, there are some similarities, but there are also a lot of differences. Um, in the open-ended version of the survey, uh, really the only similarity was people said, uh, I do puja, right? I worship the deity. People mentioned going to festivals. That was very important. Uh, people mentioned what they wear. So if you go to India and you see people with a mark of red powder on their forehead, um, that is called the tilak. That is something um, that Hindus wear. And so that is uh, part of their attire. Women would mention, for example, wearing anklets little bracelets around their ankles or, or putting colored dye on their feet. Um, people mentioned uh, fasting and visiting temple, but as you can see by, by a much smaller percentage. And kind of one of the more interesting things that, that kind of confused me a bit was people would say, I respect my parents. And that's a, uh, my parents would love to hear this, right? That that's a religious 
behavior. Um, but, uh, you know, within Christianity or Islam, we might not consider, we, we might say it's good to respect your parents. I have a daughter, right? I would like her to respect me, but that's not a, we don't think of that as a religious activity, but in Hinduism, you are kind of connected, especially because there's this idea of rebirth, you are connected to your parents and your ancestors and you're supposed to respect them. So all of this kind of shows us <coughs> that there's a very, very big difference between what academics are thinking about as Hindu religiosity and what Hindus are thinking about in terms of Hindu religiosity. In fact, the number one response when I, and, and I was out in the village asking these questions also, um, the number one, uh, um, when I said, what, is, uh, what, what, what religious rituals do you do? The number one question that people immediately respond, they said, what's a ritual, right? They, they, the Hindi English dictionary actually had 11 different words um, that translate as ritual. So I had to kind of figure out which, which one of these words was correct. And very often people said, I don't, I don't know what a ritual is. I know activities that I do that are religious, but I might not use that vocabulary of, uh, of a religious ritual. And so clearly there's a big disconnect between the way we think about religion, and the way they think about religion. So I consulted with a number of religious studies scholars. I consulted <coughs> with uh, a number of the uh, people that I surveyed and I, I came up with a new measure of Hindu religiosity. So what I did was I asked people a series of questions, agree, disagree questions, and I scaled it from one to four. So I would first ask someone, do you agree or disagree with the statement? They would say yes or no. And then if they said, I agree, I would say, do you somewhat agree or do you strongly agree, right? And a somewhat agree would be three and a strongly agree would be four. So here are some of the questions that I asked. <coughs> One really big thing in Hinduism is it's an endogamous religion. Uh, Hindus are supposed to marry Hindus. And I think across in the most recent data we have that sh shows about 95% of Hindus marry someone who is Hindu. Um, so I asked this question, would you marry someone who is not Hindu? Um, I asked this question, would you marry someone from a lower caste? India has a caste system, which is a, a hierarchical system of social organization. So you would have people who are high caste. They have, they have certain occupations like uh, uh, educators, for example, people in business. Um, and then there are people who are born to ritually low caste. They might be street sweepers or clean, clean the streets, that kind of stuff. And you really can't change your caste. You're tied to that caste for, for your entire life. Um, most people marry within their caste. So I asked people, would you marry someone from a lower caste? Um, I asked, is it important for you to teach your children about Hinduism? Uh, my assumption is people who say yes are very religious and people who say no don't really probably don't care as much about religion. Uh, a fourth question I said, it does not bother me when people make fun of my religious traditions. The, way, the reason why I say it does not bother me is I want to reverse code a question so, to make sure that people, <coughs> excuse me, to make sure that people are paying attention. Um, so the, the responses indicate most people were actually paying attention. Uh, some people got offended at this question. I said, would it offend you if, if people made fun of religion? They said, yes, of course, I'd be deeply offended. I would, I would get into a fight with them. No, no one should offend my religion. Um, I ask about fasting, right? Because uh, a lot of people believe fasting is important to receive God's blessings. Um, I tried to figure out, H Hinduism has a series of what are called life cycle rituals. <coughs> rituals you perform at various points of your life. Um, so uh, one of the most common um, life cycle rituals uh, where I conducted this survey in North India is called the Mundan, or it's a tonsure ceremony. So basically what you do is, uh, when your child is about two or three years old, um, you shave their head. And the idea is by shaving their head, you get rid of all the uh, problems from any past lives, right? So I asked uh, people, you know, if you have uh, children, is it auspicious for you to do this? People who say, no, no, I don't really care about that. Again, my assumption is that that means you are more secular, right? You are less religious. Darshan is a term that means sight. Uh, sometimes you go into a temple and if your eyes connect with the eyes of a deity, that is a, a, a very auspicious and a powerful thing that can happen. Um, I asked about the biggest uh, religious festival in the state of Bihar. 
which is the Chath festival, which is for uh, the sun. Uh, it's actually for the sun, uh, for the sun god. Um, so I asked people, the best part of this festival is that you get to buy new clothes. Again, I assume that um, if you say yes, that means that you are celebrating the festival, but for secular reasons, right? Because you get to go out and, and party with your friends. You're not <coughs> celebrating it for religious reasons. A big idea within Hinduism is the idea of purity and pollution. Um, there are certain times in your life where you are ritually polluted. So for men, I said, <coughs> you're not supposed to go into a temple, which is a holy space when you're polluted. So for men, I said, if you just lost a family member, would you go into a temple? Right. And most people were like, no, 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 I would never, I would never do that because I'm polluted. For women, if you are menstruating, you are not supposed to go into a temple. So, uh, so, so this is the question that we pose for women. I, I used a, a, a sex balance survey team. So uh, women interviewed women and men interviewed men. So, so obviously this is a sensitive question and, and I made sure only women asked that question. Um, I asked about puja because this is, this is obviously important. Uh, another reverse coded question, I said, I don't need to consult with the astrologer or pundit for fixing a wedding date. So most people, when they heard this, they said, no, 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 of course, I, I have to consult with the astrologer. Uh, otherwise I'll get in big trouble. You know, my wife will, will get really angry at me if I, if I don't do something like that. Um, I asked the question about the evil eye. Uh, you know, we use this term in English, but um, in Hinduism, it's a normative part of Hinduism, this idea that uh, at certain times uh, you could, um, especially, especially babies and especially people who, um, you know, can't protect themselves, uh, they could be vulnerable to the evil eye. Um, uh, the 13th question here, uh, I ask about eating vegetarian food. A lot of Hindus say you shouldn't eat any uh, animals. And then lastly, <coughs> I said, could an atheist be a very no uh, moral person, right? So if you put all of these kinds of questions together, um, what, I, 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 I'm basically saying a very pious Hindu is someone who marries another Hindu, who marries within their caste, who consults with the astrologer, who does puja, who eats vegetarian food, um, who um, does all of these things. And if you are a Hindu who doesn't do those things, then you are more secular. Right. So I'm trying to come up with a new scale measure for Hindu religiosity. This is what the religiosity score looks like across um, all of the people that <coughs> all the people that I interviewed. Um, it goes from zero to four. As you can see, no one is a zero. Um, and most people are kind of in this three to three point five. <coughs> I'm sorry, excuse me, three to three point five range. So most people would say that they are that they are very religious. Um, so that was my way of developing a new survey measure for Hindu religiosity in India. Now, the next thing that I wanted to do is I wanted to field these questions um, in North India. <coughs> and like I said, the goal was eventually to expand this to lots of other states. So here's the state that I studied. It's the state of uh, Bihar, as you can see, it kind of borders uh, Nepal. Um, to put this into uh, context, Bihar is about the size of Indiana, um, but imagine that Indiana had one third of the US population, right? Indiana has about, I think, 7 million people. Imagine if Indiana had 100 million people. Um, that's what we're talking about. So a tiny state, but a massive, massive population. Um, <coughs> so I went to three different districts within um, the state of Bihar. And um, I did uh, field work in all of these uh, three areas. And I uh, ended up serving about 915, um, 914 exactly, uh, uh, Hindus in these areas. So about, you know, th more than 300 in each one of these places. Um, I randomly picked these districts um, just to kind of ensure representation of the whole state. And um, I also made sure that the survey occurred. If, if uh, I'm happy to discuss more of the technical details in uh, in the Q and A, but I went to urban areas, but and I also went to rural areas. So originally I was working in villages, but I also did surveys in um, in cities, and um, I also made sure to interview um, men and women. Um, one one big problem that we have in, in, in studies of India is we do what are called head of household surveys. So we go to people's homes and we interview them and we basically only end up interviewing men. 
And so, you know, 50% of the population we don't capture in our surveys. So I wanted to try to correct that. So about 50% of my sample were, <coughs> were, were women. Um, keep in mind, I'm only interviewing Hindus. Um, so if uh, they randomly went to somebody's door and knocked on the door and it was a Muslim, um, we said, sorry, this is a survey only uh, for Hindus. And so we, we went to the next, um, next house. So, um, let me share some of my, now, now, now the fun stuff. Um, you've sat through all the theory and the conceptualization, so, so now some research findings. Um, this is a, an image of um, a, um, this is actually a Toyota truck that is, has been refashioned to look like a chariot, um, the chariot that was used by one of the uh, most famous Hindu gods in North India, the god Ram. And here is um, uh, the, this, I can't tell if you can see him, this man here wearing spectacles was the leader of the BJP at the time. This is 1992. And uh, he, uh, th there was a uh, mosque in North India that the Hindu Nationalist Party said, this is a mosque that was built on the site of a destroyed Hindu temple. And so we wanna go there and we wanna liberate the temple. And so uh, he got in the Toyota truck and he traveled all over the country. And basically almost everywhere he went, uh, there, were, there were immediately communal disturbances between Hindus and Muslims. Riots broke out all over the place. And so eventually he ended up in the city of Ayodhya where this mosque was. And he said, let's liberate the mosque. And about 100, 000, a mob of 100,000 uh, extremists uh, for the BJP descended on the mosque and uh, with uh, sledgehammers and, and other instruments, uh, destroyed it, smashed it to the ground, and uh, triggered massive Hindu-Muslim riots all over India. It's, it was one of the, the biggest uh, religious conflicts in, um, in, in post-independence India. Um, this was also one of the things that basically put the BJP onto the map. And so now we're trying to take all of these ideas about Hinduism and, and ask the question of, how does that relate to politics? Um, are people who are more um, religious in the Hindu tradition, are they more likely to like images like this, right? Like images of the Toyota truck traveling all over India, like images of the prime minister um, meditating in a cave, right? Um, so um, I'm gonna show you some slightly technical uh, uh, charts here, but I, I will try to explain everything. Maybe you, um, some of you have, uh, have seen <coughs> these kinds of uh, tables before. So dependent variables, those means the out, the, these are the outcomes that I'm interested in. Um, so I ask people, uh, first of all, in terms of political behavior, did you vote for the BJP, right? Um, I asked uh, <coughs> that question uh, in response to the 2014 national election. That's when Narendra Modi first became prime minister. Um, so I interviewed about 914 people. As you can see, OBS means observations. So only about 629 people answered the question. Some people were too young to have voted at that point. Um, but some people also said uh, to me that they didn't want to give me a response. Or some people kind of said, I don't remember. Because I explained to them, I'm an, uh, I'm an academic from America. I, I don't really care who you voted for. But some people didn't want to answer the question. Um, then I asked them, did you vote for the BJP in 2015, which is a state election? Uh, so I wanted to see, are there differences when <coughs> Modi is, is on the ballot or not on the, on the ballot? Um, and then three important questions about um, Indian secularism. So Indian secularism <coughs> is quite different than um, American uh, secularism, as I kind of mentioned at the beginning of my talk. In America, we say, our main concern is keeping religion out of politics, right? In India, it's the opposite. It's keeping politicians out of religion. Um, the, the way we think of um, Indian secularism is the word that they actually use is, is dharm nirpekshata, which translates as religious neutrality. The idea that the state will keep a distance from religion and treat all religious groups the same, okay? It doesn't matter if one religious group has 90% of the population and the other religious group has 2%, right? The idea is that they should all be treated exactly the same. So I ask people a very basic question. I say, do you believe in religious neutrality or, or, or how, how much do you support religious neutrality? Um, the min and max here means the, the, the uh, 
the the way I code the responses. So one means not at all, right? I don't support neutrality at all. Two means I somewhat support neutrality. I'm kind of in the middle. And three means, yes, I very strongly support religious neutrality, okay? So the mean here is the average you can see is 2.52 out of three. So most, most people say, overwhelmingly actually, about 70% of people say we do support religious neutrality. Um, I ask people, do you support, should the government support Hindu temples? <coughs> if they ask what that means, I say, imagine a Hindu temple is falling down and needs to be repaired. Should the government uh, um, spend money to, to rebuild this temple? Okay, so one would be no, not at all. Two would mean somewhat and three would mean yes, you know, I'm very much in support of that. So again, uh, you can see a lot of people say yes, um, we, you know, 2.75 out of three is the average. People say, yes, the government should support Hindu temples. Then I ask the exact same question about mosques. Um, because if you really are secular and you believe the government should help to rebuild temples, then you should also believe the same thing for non-Hindu uh, religious structures like <coughs> mosques, for example. Um, here you can see it's a little bit lower but it's still 2.5 out of three. It's still about 60% of Hindus still say, yes, we should, uh, we should support uh, mosques if, if they are falling down. Um, the main thing that I'm interested in is this variable of Hindu religiosity. Like I, uh, here you can see, it's about a 3.24 out of a maximum score of four. So most people are very religious. So I'm gonna look at the interaction between these variables and some things that I wanna control for. So um, age. Um, the youngest person in the survey was 18. The oldest person was 93, who I actually got to meet and interview, someone who had lived through partition, who had lived through all of this turmoil in post-independence <coughs> India. Um, I wanted to, you know, I asked people, obviously, are you a, a, a man or a, a woman? And as you can see, I'm very proud of the fact that we got almost, almost exact perfect uh, gender um, uh, or sex balance here. So 51% of the of the sample is uh, what, what was men. Um, the caste system, which I referenced earlier. So um, the BJP is often called an elite party. It's a party of elite castes, right? People who are businessmen. It's a kind of very pro-business party. Um, so a lot of people say one thing that predicts voting for the BJP will be uh, will uh, be being from a high caste. So I rank everyone's caste according to the rankings of the Indian government. Um, one is uh, if you are a scheduled caste, which is uh, the term for the former untouchables, some, some castes that are considered so uh, ritually degraded that you are not supposed to touch them. Okay, that would be a one. Uh, two would be just all general castes and three would be um, uh, what are called kind of the dominant castes or the, 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 the most elite castes. Um, and then I ask questions about education and income because um, <coughs> obviously that could also affect who people vote for. As you can see, the minimum value here is zero. Some people have no uh, education. Um, a lot of women, for example, are, are not allowed to, you know, their, their fathers or mothers say, you, you, you don't need an education, you should only be a housewife, for example. So a lot of them uh, would have no education and they would have technically no income um, because they rely on their, 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 their household income. Um, so let me show you, the, just think of this as a matrix, right? So you're looking at how the variables on the left interact with the variables on the right. Um, if there's a blank space in the cell, that means there's no relationship between the variables. If there's a plus sign, that means there's a positive relationship. If there's a negative sign, it means there's a negative relationship. And more positives or more negatives means a stronger association between the two variables. So if you're confused, let me try to explain uh, what this means. So let's look at this first column, voted for the BJP in 2014. Almost, uh, it really surprised me to initially see this. Look at Hindu religiosity, the cell is blank. There's no statistical relationship between being a very devout Hindu and voting for the BJP, right? Um, that's true for the 2014 election. Like I said, I was, I was somewhat surprised because I thought existing research all, also said there's not a very strong relationship. I thought if we measure things differently, we'll find a different outcome. But it turns out uh, Hindu religiosity doesn't seem to be correlated with voting for the BJP. Now, if you go down the column, 
age is highly correlated. That means the older you are, the more likely you are to vote for the BJP. Uh, being a man makes you less likely to vote for the BJP. They have made amazing outreach in the past few elections with women, trying to get more women to support this party. Um, as, we as you might predict, being higher caste means that you are more likely to vote for the BJP. And because they're three plus signs, it means it's a strong relationship. So this is a party of, of, uh, of elites. And so being high caste means you, you are more likely to vote for them. Um, if you're a high caste, you probably are also more educated. You also probably have more income. Um, so the main thing we're interested in here is really Hindu religiosity. So it's not related with voting for the BJP in 2014. It's not related for 2015 in the state election, but here's where we start to see some interesting findings. <coughs> the more pious you are, the less likely you are to say that you support religious neutrality. Um, this means if you are very religious Hindu and you're asked this question, should the government treat all religions equally? Your response would be no, I don't agree with that statement at all. Now, when because I was doing the survey with people, I interacted with them and sometimes when watching these interviews, I would suddenly interject and I would say, wait, wait, hold on, let me, let me try to figure out why you feel that way. It's not that uh, Hindus said openly Islamophobic things, you know, they didn't say uh, things like, I don't like Muslims. Very often they had neighbors who were Muslim. They didn't say things like that some of the BJP, some of the more extreme politicians will say things like Muslims should go to Pakistan, they're not welcome here, that kind of thing. What they would usually say to me was, listen, Muslims are 15% of the population in India, we're 80%. So why should the government treat us equally? right? They would say this is a Hindu state because the majority of people who live here are Hindu. Now, that's not what the constitution says. The constitution says we don't care about population size. Everyone is treated the same. Uh, it doesn't matter if you have 99% and the other group has one. In The law is secular and everyone should be treated equally. Um, more pious Hindus don't agree with that. And they say, I, I don't support that idea of neutrality. As you can probably predict, when I ask them the question about temples, should we rebuild temples that are falling down? They say, yes, absolutely we should. But suddenly they change their mind when asked about mosques. And again, they don't say things like, oh, I don't like Muslims. You know, they would say, Mus you know, if the mosque is falling down, that's unfortunate, but Muslims should pay for that themselves. This is a Hindu state. This is a Hindu country. This is a Hindu civilization. Uh, we really don't, um, we really don't think that the government should be obligated to pay for this. So they're not saying openly bigoted things, but they are saying things that are uh, majoritarian is the term we would use. Whoever is the majority gets to basically run roughshod over the minority. And many BJP politicians kind of make this argument either explicitly or implicitly. They say Muslims and other groups, Christians and, uh, and Jews and Sikhs and you know, uh, other religious, uh, India is, is, a, is home to basically every religion in the world. They basically say that you, know, you, you might have to accept being a second class citizen. Um, this is a country where Hindus are first among equals. And so we don't find the religiosity effect for voting for the BJP, but it does mean, uh, it, we, we do find the effect in terms of neutrality. So to go back to that original image of Narendra Modi, why is he going into the um, cave to try to get um, this image projected of himself as a, as, a, uh, as, a, uh, as a Hindu holy man who became a politician? It's not necessarily to get more votes, right? That, that doesn't necessarily help him. It's maybe to undermine this idea of religious neutrality. If more Hindus become <coughs> pious, maybe they can continue to kind of erode this idea that India is a country that belongs to all religious traditions. It, they can start to inculcate this idea that India is a land for Hindus and everyone else who lives here has to accept being a second class citizen. So let me conclude just by kind of uh, uh, summarizing some of my main points and then thinking about how India could maybe be a branching off point to other, other religions or other parts of the world. So I, I would argue that our existing research on Hinduism has measurement problems. We can't just ask, do you believe in God? Do you pray? Do you go to temple? We need uh, more, more complicated, more sophisticated ways of measuring Hindu religiosity. Hinduism is just not the same as Christianity or Islam or Judaism. We have to think more broadly about how, how to measure it. And I hope to do that in, 
in, in uh, uh, my ultimate goal is to try to do 10 states and 10,000. Uh, I've done about, uh, you know, close to 1,000 so far. I hope to do 10,000 in total uh, and give us really new detailed data about, about Hindus in India. Um, the main research finding from my survey is that Hindu religiosity is inversely related to support for secularism. So the more religious you are, the less support you have for secularism. And really, Indian secularism historically has been uh, one of the country's success stories. And so if that changes, that would be very bleak and a very dark uh, path for the country. Um, and then lastly, I would say um, we should think about sometimes Hinduism is grouped with Buddhism, Confucianism, Shinto uh, under, the, uh, under the label of the Asian religions. Um, so we need to think about new ways of uh, measuring uh, religiosity or, or measuring uh, religion and political behavior in these Asian traditions. And uh, I would argue that we, we still are looking at a lot of these countries and just thinking about using as our reference point Christianity and just assuming that these countries uh, can be measured in the same way. And that's, that's always going to give us very deceptive and, and potentially incorrect research findings. So I hope that maybe scholars working on these other traditions would be able to use some of this work as a, as a branching off point uh, to study other um, Asian traditions. So thank you so much for your attentiveness. I hope it wasn't too technical and uh, I really look forward to, um, to the Q&A. Thanks very much, uh, Jay. We do have some uh, some questions coming in. Uh, one has to do with um, women and fasting. Why is it that women in Hinduism tend to be more likely to be those that uh, fast and any other gender differences that are particularly salient? Um, if you could tell us about that, please. Yeah, so I would say that there is this general idea uh, and, and keep in mind, India is a very patriarchal country, right? It's, it's a country where 70% um, uh, of people still live in villages and, and there's still very patriarchal norms in, in those places. Women are kind of expected to be the carriers of religion for the family. Um, there were a lot of young people people who I asked, do you do puja? And they would say, no, my mom does it for the whole family, or uh, sometimes not, not necessarily the mother, but the grandmother, or um, you know, the, the father's eldest sister, who, uh, this is not the nuclear family, this is extended family. Uh, actually, in my survey, the average number of people in a household was over 10. Um, so this is not, you know, mom and dad and two kids, right? This is grandma and maybe uncles and aunts. And so women, um, are supposed to be the people that kind of keep the flame. They're the ones who always take religion um, th the most seriously for the household. And so when it's, a, when it's the festival time and, it's, and someone in the family has to fast, everyone understands it's gonna be the mother or the grandmother who does that. And they do that for everybody. That is part of their, um, that is, th that is part of their role in the, um, in the, in the family. Um, in terms of other gender differences, um, I would say in general, and this is not, not just true in India, but really surveys done in almost every country in the world show that women tend to be more religious than men, tend to score higher on these metrics. Um, so I think in lots of other countries, women are expected to be more religious. Um, and also um, one question that I asked uh, everyone in the survey was, I said, who is the most religious person in your household? And the number one answer that people gave was um, my mother. Uh, the number two answer was my grandmother. Um, so um, there's, there's a very strong sense that women are supposed to uh, be the most religious person. And, and one last thing I'll say here is, you know, I tell my students that even, it's a, even though it's a very patriarchal country, you know, Mohandas Gandhi, who, who led the Indian independence movement, he said in his autobiography, he said, the, the only reason I learned about Hinduism, everything I know about Hinduism, was, uh, was something I learned from my mother. Uh, she would recite stories to me, she would sing songs to me, and uh, I learned about being very devout from her. So it can have a really big influence um, in, in politics more broadly. Yeah, that's a great question. Okay, another question. Is there a correlation between Hinduism not having any set beliefs and their religion not predicting how they will vote? Yes, absolutely, I think so. I think, um, you know, um, the BJP, 
the BJP more and more is trying to say, if you are a good Hindu, if you are a devout Hindu, you should vote for us. But I think that because you can believe so many different things, that argument doesn't necessarily work with voters because uh, Hindu voters are so accustomed to thinking that I can believe this or I cannot believe this. If anyone tells me I have to vote for this party or that party, th they live in a, in, in a universe that, that is very fluid and you're allowed to, to change your beliefs and it's not a very uh, doctrinaire or a very creedal religion. Um, so I definitely think there's a relationship there between, between those two things. As one person put it to me in an interview, he said, there's no Hindu brigade that goes around and tells us who to vote for. If I like someone, I will vote for them. But if they tell me I should do it because of Hinduism, um, that's, that's not something that I'm going to do. So I, I did meet people who were Hindu atheists that said, you know, people try to tell me all the time, I need to believe in God. Um, there's so many thousands of gods in Hinduism, why wouldn't you believe in one of them? And they often respond, because I, I don't have to. Um, that's the beauty of my religion is that I have a lot more scope to believe what I want to believe. So I think that absolutely does affect politics. Okay. Um, a question, in our democracy, <clears throat> excuse me, in our democracy, there is a separation between church or religion and state. In India, are both religion and political affiliations merged? Yeah, so what's interesting is, um, according to the Supreme Court of India, um, Hinduism is, uh, is not a religion. Um, they uh, said in a very famous ruling that Hinduism, because it doesn't have a strong set of beliefs, <coughs> because there aren't compulsory practices, they said Hinduism is, and they use this term that uh, some Hindus prefer to use rather than religion. They said it's a way of life. Um, it, it affects everything you do from the moment you get up to the moment you go to sleep. And that's not a religion. Um, so uh, I, I, I don't agree with that. I think, um, you know, what the court said was, if you look at Christianity and Islam, Hinduism is very different. And so it's not a religion. And my response would be, it's just a very different kind of religion. Um, so uh, according to the constitution uh, in, in, the, in the 70s, they added the term secular. And so India is, is technically, a, is according to the constitution, a secular country. Um, census forms and other kinds of government forms will ask, what is your religion? They don't give the option usually of no religion or atheist or anything like that. Um, and so those identities, um, on the one hand, are not supposed to be super important, but I think everyone understands that they are very important. So you will get asked in India all the time, you know, what is your religion? What sect do you belong to? It's a very open, common, form, you know, sometimes here in the US, we treat it as a private uh, act, but in India, everything is kind of is very public. So those identities can be very much intertwined. Okay. A uh, questioner wants to uh, explore how Hinduism correlates to caste and um, maybe relatedly, is caste still legal in India and um, what's the, whether it's legal or not and how widely practiced is it in India, please? Yeah, so the, the, when they wrote the constitution, they technically abolished the caste system, which had uh, zero effect whatsoever. It's, it's kind of a big joke. Um, it would be like, you know, if President Biden passed an executive order that said, I abolish racism, right? It wouldn't get rid of racism overnight. You can't get rid of the caste system overnight. So, uh, no, I think caste is still extremely important to uh, almost all, uh, not just Hindus, but also um, people from other uh, religions. So people who are Muslim have caste. People who are Christian can have castes. Um, there are lots of uh, a different castes across religions. And so it is still very important. Most people, like I said, marry within their caste. Most people marry within their religion. And so there's a lot of segregation um, between communities. I think that <coughs> caste is, a, is, is usually tied to an occupation. And so, you know, you might be born, like, like I said, for example, there are educator castes. So you might be born into a caste uh, like I'm a college professor, right? So you might be born into uh, um, uh, a, a specific occupation like that. Um, one interesting thing that's happening, maybe maybe one area where you start to see the caste system break down is in, in cities, 
Um, there are lots of new jobs that are hard to categorize as being high caste or low caste. Um, it's, not, it's not really clear. So I was once at a talk where somebody said, every day in India, pre-pandemic uh, at least, there are about 5 million Domino's pizzas that are delivered. Domino's pizza is really, really big uh, mm -hmm. in India. And if you are someone who works for Domino's and you're a delivery boy, here in the US, we would say, this is a job usually done by teenagers or, you know, it's it's not a job that requires a lot of education, right? You just have to have a car or a bike and you can deliver pizza. Um, is that a low caste occupation? I don't know, you know, uh, in order to work for Domino's, you probably have to speak English. So that's an indicator that you're you're not just educated, but you're kind of Western educated. Um, you're working for a large multinational corporation. Um, is that potentially a high, you know, it's, it's hard to say if that's a low caste or a high caste occupation. So the caste system is still very important, but I think more and more scholars are trying to figure out in the, in the new service economy, uh, how, do we, how do we peg some of these jobs as being high caste or low caste? Um, in terms of relation to Hinduism, um, it is still hugely important in Hinduism, but again, it's important in other religions too. So you can have people who are low caste, who are Muslim or low caste, who are, who are Christian. Um, so the caste system is not, it, it's not just Hindu, it's kind of a pan-Indian um, social system. Okay, um, a, a follow-up question on caste. Is it possible to change one's caste? What happens if you want to upgrade your caste and not to be a, a laborer, for example? You cannot change your caste, no. Um, you know, in the, in the old days, the idea was maybe um, you could travel far away from, uh, from where you live if you're a laborer and you could go to another state, you know, a thousand miles away and kind of restart your life as a high caste, but um, first of all, most laborers couldn't afford to do that. And second of all, you wouldn't have the social connections. And, you know, people can tell a lot about you just on the basis of the way you look or um, your last name. So anyone who sees my last name in India would immediately know my religion, uh, my caste, what state I'm from, uh, what language I speak, that kind of thing. And so it would be very hard to, to change your caste. If you are low caste, probably the only thing you could do is maybe you could marry someone from a higher caste. Um, so that's not going to change. Th that could change your, your economic situation. It's not going to change your social status. It might change the social status of your children. But whatever caste you are born into is, um, is basically your caste for life. OK. We have um, a question or two touching on the uh, diaspora of, of Hindus from uh, India and elsewhere in the United States. Uh, for example, do most American Hindus continue with the same beliefs and traditions, or do these often become diluted after they've lived in the US for a while? And uh, I was also thinking about intermarriage. Uh, many of us have been to weddings or know of couples where one partner is of a Hindu background and the other from a different faith tradition, Christian, Judaism, and so on. Um, please comment on the you know, religiosity in the diaspora, if you could. Yeah, that's a, it's a good question. And I, I sometimes think in the future, maybe, especially during the pandemic, I was thinking maybe it would be easier to do online surveys here uh, in the meantime with, with American Hindus. I think, you know, I, I'll be honest, I'm not super knowledgeable about American Hindus, but um, what I understand is that sometimes there's this generational effect where the parents come here and, um, you know, try their best to get the kids to, um, you know, kind of uphold the traditions and usually at some point just kind of give up. And then the next generation, uh, very often they try to kind of reconnect with India or reconnect with their traditions, that kind of thing. So, um, I do think one thing that um, is, is noteworthy about the Hindu diaspora is that there are many members of the diaspora here in the United States who um, have funded, you know, especially those who have gotten quite rich in Silicon Valley or in, in you know, in other kinds of fields, uh, STEM fields. Um, they have funded organizations um, that, that have tried to 
um, um, uh, kind of a, a spread uh, awareness of Hinduism or kind of cultural organizations to teach people about Hinduism to band together American Hindus. And I think a lot of people say that uh, th that uh, American Hindus uh, on average might be slightly more conservative than um, than other uh, diasporic groups. So um, I think there's a lot more research to to be done uh, uh, to be done there, but it's definitely a fascinating question. Um, can you point to any significant ways in which the media, and particularly thinking of the internet and of film, movies in, uh, in India, how has that shaped, how has the media shaped people's attitudes towards religion, politics, and democracy, for example? Yeah, how has media shaped American uh, thoughts about Hinduism? In, and I'm thinking in India, for example, Indian film, uh, wide availability of, of social media and so on. Yeah, uh, one of the things that I really noticed um, the last time I was in India in 2019 was when I would talk to people and interview Hindus, you know, very often um, I'd give them my card or I'd say, you know, if you if you have any problems, or you have any issues with the survey, you can give me uh, you can give me a call. Um, and then I would notice that um, if you know if you know what this app uh, WhatsApp, which is owned by uh, Facebook, it's probably the most common messaging software in India, and uh, more and uh, more and more now hundreds of millions of people there have have cell phones, and a large number have smartphones. I would start to get all these WhatsApp messages every morning when I woke up, and it would be an image of Ganesh, the elephant-headed Hindu god, or Hanuman, the, the monkey god. And so, you know, it would say something like, good morning, or I hope you have a blessed day, or these kinds of things. And so all of that, yes, to doing the namaste image, all of that became really, really common, and I think has, has definitely helped to uh, spread Hinduism, especially among a younger generation of, of, of Hindus. Thank you so much, Ajay. Our, our professor, our, um, our time is, is up, and I uh, want to thank you very much for sharing these insights and your research uh, findings with us. And yes, thank you so much. That was so interesting. And I'm with you on Rafael Nodal, by the way. Uh, <laughs> go, Rafa. go, Rafa. Thanks so much, and we'll see all you next week. Don't forget that survey is coming. See you soon. Thank you Bye -bye. so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.